Before we jump into the technical research design, there is one extra step that we should do before finalizing the conceptual research design. And this is the so-called defining concepts. Concepts that will fine-tune our thoughts about the research question and sub-questions and also will fine-tune the conceptualization we have for our research objective. Defining concepts then becomes the chapter 5 of this series of videos. When we define concepts, in principle we gather enough information and we fine-tune our thoughts about questions and about the objective. This is just an exercise, certainly necessary, before we jump into the gathering of material, conceptualization of, of, of strategies, and the research planning. It is about the unexpected phenomena that could happen when performing the research project. If we define carefully core concepts, it means that we can find the opportunities for improvement and the pre-knowledge we have. And also we'll define strategies and we'll define methods to gather data or just materials, necessary materials. And this is just before starting the technical part of the research and should be part of the conceptual research design. When we talk about the stipulative concepts, it means that we talk about definitions. They cannot be correct or inconnect. They just can differ from each other. The definitions can differ from each other. But certainly they should contribute to the understanding of the research objective. These stipulative definitions are in terms of delineation, observable, meaning what is the operationalization here, the indicators, the technical requirements, for instance, from the stakeholder analysis, or it can be linking up a very particular research objective. In principle, the definitions should be connected to the feasibility to get the answers, the answers to the questions. Again, it should be connected to technical specifications, observable phenomena, and this is why our objective also should be smart, because we will be able to measure, and certainly will be time-bound, or also will be realistic. Now, this linking characteristic of stipulative definitions not only applies to the research objective, but also to our research questions. And here we enter in one of the last topics of this first part of the book, the conceptual modeling. These casual relationships between subsystems, interrelations, inputs and outputs, the so-called system description. This particular figure always calls my attention. It's taken from the book of system thinking, the book of Jackson, and it divides the conceptual modeling in the real world and that world in terms of systems thinking. We can read the figure like this. First, in the real world, we have a problematic situation. And that problematic situation is expressed. Then, in the plane of system thinking, we go to the root definitions and we create conceptual models. Then we can go back to the real world and compare our conceptualization of reality with the real situation. Most probably, based on our modeling approach, we will propose changes. And if our modeling approach is not so far from reality, we may be able to solve the problem. Then conceptual modeling could be one out of three, or a combination of any of these three elements. Descriptive of nature, relationships between objects, variables, entities of a system, interrelations. It can be also just a casual model. We can also see and only see relationships. But finally, conceptual modeling also is meant to have abstractions, abstractions or simplifications of reality. In principle, every model is always wrong, but at least we do our best to have a rigorous approximation of reality. 
We have here one example of a system description where clearly we will have one input and two outputs and it's about transportation of hydrogen. It can be hydrogen that starts in 200 bar and then we create a higher and higher compression such that we can reach three, more than 300 bars for transportation with trucks or more than 700 bar when you want to use this hydrogen for transportation in vehicles. Now we can see here different subsystems, compressor, buffer, a second buffer, a third buffer, a third compressor. Clearly there are subsystems, clearly there are interrelations and actually we have one input and two outputs as I said at the beginning. If it's the hydrogen filling station, even this station, which was previously a system, now become a system of systems. The station has heat exchangers, chillers, separators. Even we need to get rid of the impurities before we go 200, from 200 bars to 450 or 950 bars for the transportation application. It means that we went from level 0 to level 1, for instance. A system description, together with the scope in the system, certainly are requirements when preparing a research plan. Jackson also provides a second example in terms of biological system models. And we can even have control engineering applied to system biological models. But here we even have management, we have subsystems, boundaries, inputs, outputs, lots of relationships, also connected to the environment. Finally, we can even see the negative feedback system applied to different engineering fields. An input and an output, the boundary, the desired goal, the activator, process and sensor. This can represent just a production line. This can represent a robot, or it can represent a hydroelectric power plant. And these basic patterns of casual relationships provided in the appendix of the book are just an example on key elements that could be considered when defining your system, your system description. We can have direct effects, indirect effects, feedback effects, depending on your variables. When preparing your system description, also you need to think about the, the scope. And the scope is directly connected to the research objective, because your objective should be realistic and it should have some time boundaries. Here we are now defining concepts. Concepts, core concepts connected to our research objective. Actually, our research framework, it's a conceptualization map of different stages of the research project. But also we have mentioned the system description, inputs, outputs, subsystems, interrelations, and scoping down our project and marking that the scope in the diagram, in the drawing that represents your system. Certainly those are key requirements when preparing your research plan or your design plan, depending on the type of case you will deal with. In principle, we have enough tools to deal with our first online team-based learning. Everything is connected to the conceptualization stage of a research project. We go from understanding the problem to the definition of our sub-questions and even finding core questions. And then comes the system description, thinking in systems, conceptualization, our boundaries. What are those inputs and outputs, subsystems, interrelations? Once you have this conceptual map, this drawing, you can always scope down your project. You can always mark the scope, what subsystem actually is part of the problem. System description should be used before designing your research objective. And it should be used to understand the problem, meaning that the system description should be there before 
you have the problem statement. System description can be part of the Ishikawa diagram. It can be part of the YWAT model. Those are conceptual maps connected to core concepts to fine tune the conceptual map of the research. And those are exercises that we should do before we jump into the technical part, before we define methods and tools, before we define the planning. And that is going to be part of the second TBL. But first, let's focus on the topics, of course, for the first TBL.